scripture this afternoon is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20, and Kathleen is our liturgist. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, the man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could find him anymore. But even with a chain, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cross <coughs> them and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are men. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pig pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this to the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who, who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the, in the Decropolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Such is the word of God. Thanks. 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 Lord God, please give to me the gift of preaching, so the words I share will be the words you want shared. And please fill all of us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, so that we will all hear the message that you want heard. In Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Now you probably noticed that you have a copy of the scripture in your bulletins uh, behind the lyrics, and I hope you'll follow along. We're going to take a, a close look at these verses together. So today we continue this walk through the Gospel of Mark as we begin chapter 5. And previously, you know, we've been through a lot of interesting stuff. We've seen how the Pharisees and scribes wanted to do away with Jesus because he's a threat to their own power and their status. After all, how dare he heal a man on the Sabbath and then say something like Sabbath was made for the man, not man for the Sabbath. They accuse him of healing and casting out demons by the power of the prince of demons, which makes no sense. They miss out on the joy that everyone else is experiencing as Jesus heals people and frees them. They don't even like the way he widens the concept of family. So the next day, Jesus teaches everyone in Capernaum, where he's been staying using parables, and he has to do that by sitting out in a boat, since the crowd is so large, large, and pretty much everybody wants a piece of him. They want just a moment of his time, they want to touch him. But he wants to teach, so he's teaching from the boat. 
the end of that very long day, he sets out for the other side of the Sea of Galilee, just as he was, we said, hungry and tired. But his journey is noticed in the spirit world, and quite suddenly there's an unusual violent storm, which doesn't usually happen at night, and it is a mega storm, as we talked about too in the Greek, and it's sinking the boat. In other words, it's ginormous. It's bigger than anything you can imagine. And something or someone does not want Jesus to get to his next destination. But Jesus rebukes the storm, or more particularly, the evil presence that caused the storm, and the sea is suddenly now mega quiet and calm, instantly. When the disciples saw what Jesus was able to do, they were, they were overwhelmed with, uh, anybody remember? A mega holy fear. Who is this man, they asked. Who is this man? Well, Jesus was actually answering that question with his actions, along with his words. Now, if you look at verse 1 of today's reading, we learn that Jesus has made it across the sea, even though somebody didn't want him to. But he's made it, and he's gone to this region that is part of the Decapolis, the ten cities. And these were independent cities that were mostly Greek in culture, and they were mostly Gentile. So we have to ask ourselves then, well, why was Jesus going there if this was Gentile territory? Well, did you know what it originally was? Anybody know? Okay, it was originally the land appointed to the half-tribe of, of Manasseh. The half-tribe of Manasseh. Oh. Yeah. So in other words, it was originally part of the promised land. And there were still some Jews living there. So as we know, Jesus did only what he saw the Father doing. So the Father was obviously at work in this part of the promised land, regardless of who was living there. Now verse 2 says that Jesus was barely out of the boat when a man who was afflicted with this unclean spirit, a.k.a. a demon, came running to meet him. Was this man one of the few Jews who still lived in the region of Manasseh? Well, we are told. We don't really know. But we do know that this man, or rather the evil spirit within him, was well aware that Jesus was on his way. No cell phones were needed at the time. No text. They knew. The word went out in the spirit world. Jesus was on a mission to deal with him. Very specific. Now, the man that was possessed started his descent to the beach well before Jesus even made landfall. Because there's a picture of this. The name of the town is Kersa, actually. It's right on the edge of the sea, and <coughs> there's a beach, and then these walls, these cliffs go up, and there are these tombs, these caves, right in the cliff. So he had to start his descent well before Jesus got there to meet him on the beach when the boat arrived. So look at verses 3 through 5. They tell us more about the life of this tormented man. He lived by himself, not in a home, but among the dead, in tombs that were carved into those cliffs. This man also had superhuman strength and would break apart any chain or any shackle that was placed on his hands or his feet or tied around his waist. He was in constant torment torment from the parasite that had taken over his life. And his terrifying behavior was the evidence of what was going on. Now commentators will point out that he himself was unclean for four reasons. I see that over and over again. But if he was a Gentile, that's a moot point. He just was unclean at that point. And we don't know what he was. But if he was a Jew, well, simply living among the Gentiles would have made him unclean. The second thing is being in a tomb among the dead made you unclean. Three, if you were living among pigs, where pigs were, you were unclean. And fourth, he was a host for unclean spirits. So this guy had four strikes against him. 
Yes, he was unclean. We can certainly understand that. But I don't think he cared about the ceremonial unclean stuff at all. I think he cared about the situation he was in. He was completely overtaken by something other than himself. We know possession is rare, but it does happen. This man was possessed. He had no ability to do anything for himself. And this other spoke for him, decided for him, moved for him, and displayed strength that no human has. As we said, it broke heavy chains off and it drove away any human being brave enough to come near him. Now we're going to read verses 6 through 9a in a different order to show what actually happened on the timeline. So bear with me. First, verse 6. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. Now verse 8. Jesus said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Now verse 7. The man shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. And now, verse 9a, Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? So that's the order in which this whole thing occurred. So Jesus also knew before he arrived on the shore that he was heading for a big confrontation. And here it was. The demon knew Jesus was coming and was there to meet him. And in spite of himself, as we see in verse 6, he had to fall on his knees before Jesus in worship. He had to. He didn't want to, but he knew he had no choice. He knew exactly who Jesus was. And them's the rules in the spirit world, like it or not. And he was a danger to other human beings. But you notice that with Jesus... He was obedient, even though a bit whiny. But he had no choice. So now in verse 7, he calls Jesus the Son of the Most High God. So what does that mean? Well, we know that in all the surrounding territories, and in that territory, the Decapolis, Manasseh itself, there were false gods everywhere. Some of them were just powerless human-made wooden or stone idols. But some of them were actually demons masquerading as false gods. There's still plenty of those around today. But there is only one true and therefore most high God, higher than other, all the other false gods, all the other religions. God is over all else. So, and Jesus' very presence, his power, his authority, caused physical pain in this demon. It hurt him to be around Jesus. So he yells at him, what do you want with me? Don't torture me. Now, did you notice that this argument started after Jesus had told the unclean spirit to leave? That's why we read that in chronological order. The argument started after. So somehow this powerful entity was still able to argue with Jesus about leaving, even though it was obviously painful. Now, Matthew's Gospel adds a bit of information that I think is helpful to us here. It might even explain what that's about. In Matthew's Gospel, it adds, the demon asked Jesus, has he come to torment him before the time? Before the time. So before what time? Well, the time. <laughs> First, the time, the coming time when Jesus, through his death and resurrection, would take back the authority that we gave away through our original sin in the Garden of Eden. And then, of course, there's the ultimate, final victory over evil. When Jesus returns, and evil is sent to the lake of fire, chained up for good. But before the time, before the time, Satan still had authority on earth. Some authority. Not as much as Jesus, but on earth he had some. And Jesus was coming to take it back, but he hadn't fully done it yet. So, 
The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ not only restores the limited authority, but Jesus also shares that limited authority with us. Remember, he said after his resurrection, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, followers, go and do what I've been doing. Go and make disciples. So that's important information. So you see, this demon is actually hoping to catch Jesus on a technicality. Because demons are legalists. But it didn't work. Jesus is clearly more powerful. And he then demands to know the demon's name. Knowing a name means you have power over them. Remember that. He says, what is your name? And the demon has to answer. So in verse 9b, we see it. The unclean spirit is forced to identify himself as legion. There were many living in this poor man. Now, legion is a Roman designation for a large army battalion. This was war. This legion was part of a spiritual war doing battle in the Decapolis. Not just in this poor man, who was their host, but for the souls of all the people in the region. That's where he was assigned. That's where he made his home. And he was going to do battle. Except Jesus showed up. So this we know is why Jesus came to the land that rightly belonged to one of the 12 tribes of Israel. To defeat a powerful army, legion, that held it captive. And to free, uh, to free the poor man in whom they had made their barracks. That's where they lived. So this was a territorial, hierarchical spirit with enough power to harass an entire region and to create a mega storm on the Sea of Galilee. Now, if you look at verses 10 through 13, we have some negotiation going on. Jesus is begged repeatedly not to send legion out of his territory. You see verse 10? Yeah. And instead, Legion says he'll leave the man he inhabits, but he wants to stay in the Decapolis by entering the pig herd. And Jesus lets him. Why? Well, we don't know for sure, but here's what we do know. And I have to say, do I, do I know this for sure? No, but as I prayed about it, this is what came to me. Once Jesus gives his permission, right? Legion enters the pigs, who refuse to cooperate with this sudden invasion. They promptly plunge themselves into the sea, off the cliffs and into the sea. Now, Legion finds himself, and all 2,000 of them, with no host, no place to live. What happens to demons in scripture? You guys know scripture. Where do they have to go when they have no host? Not yet, eventually. Hey. To the dry places. Oh. Remember that? Mm -hmm. The story about the seven demons are cast out, they have to go to the dry places, they hang out there for a while, but they come back and find the guy swept clean and empty, so they go back with some friends. Oh. The dry places. Where are the dry places? We don't know. Oh. The dry places are, by scripture, where demons go when they don't have a host. Oh. So, these demons probably had to go now to the dry places. They've got no home. And that would free up the territory for a time. Now, they don't have to stay there. We know that also from scripture. But that's where they go when they lose their host. So in verses 14 through 17, we have some shocked herdsmen who saw something unimaginable. Can you imagine witnessing this from a small distance away? So from a distance, they see this notorious man of the tomb, so they stay well away from. And he's kneeling in worship before Jesus. Imagine what they thought. And then they see this discussion. And finally, they witness the whole pig herd, 2,000 pigs, jumping off a cliff and drowning. So they run away. And as soon as they get back to the town, they spread the news. And the townspeople come running back with them. And they all see something unheard of. 
they see the violent man of the tombs, who they're scared to death of, sitting quietly with Jesus. Now he's dressed, and he's at peace. He's at peace. He's just sitting with Jesus. Fine. And they hear the story of the confrontation and of the pigs. And so were they overjoyed to see this man restored and well and whole? Well, we hope they would be. But in verse 17, you see, the townspeople beg Jesus to leave their region. Go away. Now, maybe they were horrified that they lost some of their livelihood, livelihood when they lost the pigs. A lot of times we'll see that. Perhaps that's why they wanted Jesus to leave. Or maybe it was something else. Maybe it was once again, as we talked about last week, a mega holy fear. Who is this man? Who is this man who's shaken our world and gotten rid of the evil that was in our midst for so long that was terrorizing us? Who has freed and healed the poor man who tormented us just as he was tormented? Who is this man? Well, the true answer is the one the demon knew. <laughs> he knew it. This man is the son of the Most High God. Only God could do what he did in this transformed man, on the stormy sea, for the man on healing the man on the Sabbath, and on and on and on. But the answer for the townspeople right then was, this man is too much for us. We can't handle this. We can't handle the truth of his power. Please, Jesus, leave this place. We're too scared. And Jesus does. He leaves. He gets back in the boat, he tells us. So, is he abandoning them? Well, not at all. He has quite purposely set something in motion that's going to make a big difference in the spiritual well-being of many of the people in that territory. And we learn about this wonderful plan he has in verses 18 through 20. So take a look at them. We're going to read them. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. So, Jesus had a plan all along. No surprise there. The freed man could have come along with Jesus and had a wonderful experience as a disciple, learning at his feet, getting new friends, being thankful for the freedom that he's received. It would have been great. It sounds good, but Jesus had bigger plans for him and for the region. He made him, amazingly enough, not a disciple like many people have said. He made him an apostle. He made him an apostle before he even made his 12 disciples into apostles. In, in chapter 6, he sends them out for a time and then brings them back. A disciple is a student who learns from a rabbi following him around, asking, asking questions, listening to him. An apostle is one who is sent out to spread the good news. Jesus sent this man out to his own people in his own home territory to tell them about what the Lord had done and the power he has and his mercy and the freedom that this man now has because of Jesus Christ. How, as the, the hymn says, he saved a wretch like me. What better witness to the good news could Jesus have sent? Who better than this guy? I mean, he's going to stun everybody he speaks to. How powerful will this man's testimony be to those he formerly terrorized? It would be similar to the testimony of the Apostle Paul, who once terrorized Christians before he became like the chief of all apostles. We don't know the name of this man from the Decapolis. I kind of wish we did. 
but we do know that he was one of the very first, maybe the first apostle Jesus sent out into the world. And I'm guessing his witness made a powerful impact. And we do know the reaction he received. It's in our closing verse, which says, all the people were, what? Amazed. 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 We have an amazing God, don't we? Absolutely. The most high God who sees who each one of us really is, who sees us under all the baggage that we sometimes carry, who understands every battle and every trial that we face, who calls us out from under the oppression into freedom, and then sends us out to share the good news. If you have ever beaten yourself up over your history, anybody here ever beaten yourself up over your history? Yeah. If you've ever thought you have too much past baggage to be useful to God, think of this guy. Think of this man. The bigger our transformation, the more powerful our witness, our testimony, by the grace of God. As the former slave trader turned priest wrote, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And the second verse you probably know, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us pray. Lord God, you are more amazing than we can get our heads around. You are awesome in every way, and your grace is more than we deserve, but we are so very grateful. Lord, teach us to keep our eyes on you and give us the boldness of this man who, when Jesus called him to do it, he turned right around and went out and spread the gospel with all those he met. We thank you for your amazing grace, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now it is our blessed opportunity to give back to the Lord just a portion of what he has shared with us. Would you help us?